And that's the question that I've been dealing with since. Now, to give a little bit more background to how I dealt with it, I joined OCR in 2002. 2002 was a rather disturbing year for anti-Semitism in higher education. Uh, I know I'm dealing now with people with far greater expertise than I am, so you may know in more detail that during the year 2002, there was a, a wave of reported incidents which was far greater than we had seen in, in prior years. On college campuses, it was in April 2002 that a now notorious flyer was distributed throughout the San Francisco State campus that had a, forgive me, I'll be explicit, a large photograph of a dead baby, and under it were emblazoned in words, uh, uh, Palestinian uh, uh, baby meat uh, slaughtered uh, by Jewish right according to American license, or something along those, those lines. A rather explicit uh, reference or reiteration uh, of the blood libel used in a way that was clearly political and yet at the same time also uh, clearly anti-Semitic and, and racial. Within a month of that, there was on that same campus an incident in which a uh, peace rally uh, went bad. You familiar with this? On San Francisco State, May of, uh, some yes, some no, May of 2002. Shortly after that flyer was distributed, there was a peace rally. A number of people spoke about peace between Israel and Palestine. One elderly uh, Russian Jewish man got up to speak uh, poignantly about how glad he was after years of persecution in the Soviet Union that he was in a place where uh, Jews were, uh, were not subject uh, to that sort of thing. The rally ended. Uh, the 300 or so people mostly uh, left until there were only a very small number of Jewish students and faculty who were left. And at that point, a counter-protest, which had been building in, in, in uh, intensity, uh, got so great with cries of, um, uh, cries of uh, F the Jews, die racist pigs, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, get out or we will kill you. The, the, by this point, the mom started to scream, Hitler did not finish the job. Uh, yelling uh, uh, epithets and, and, uh, and threats of this, of this sort until the police had to take the remaining uh, uh, Jewish members of the group and uh, essentially march them to their safety, to the, to the Hillel, uh, an incident that was something of a wake-up call for those of us who thought that anti-Semitism was no longer the problem that it had once been on American college campuses. Uh, not long after that, maybe a year and a half after that, the David Project uh, released a film, Columbia Unbecoming. Some of you are familiar with that. Uh, it, documented, uh, it documented incidents involving the so-called MILAC uh, department, the Middle Eastern Studies program within Columbia University, and especially conflicts between uh, Middle Eastern Studies faculty and pro-Israel Jewish students, uh, where Jewish students uh, essentially argued that they had been uh, silenced or uh, uh, that their views suppressed in some way or other. Uh, in one memorable incident, a um, uh, professor in the middle of a class articulated his view that Palestinians had a prior claim to the land of Israel. Um, not in and of itself a, a, a notable remark, but after that uh, remark, he got into a kind of a uh, dispute with a student. And as she relates it on the film, their arguments in class led to a discussion outside of class. They walked together outside, having a rather intense conversation. And when he drew me outside of the classroom, she said, he said to me, you have no voice in this debate. And she said, of course I'm allowed to express my opinion. To which he responded, look, you have green eyes. You are not a Semite. I'm a Semite. I have brown eyes. You have no claim to the land of Israel. Close quote. So we had at this point, 2002, 2003, 2004, a number of incidents starting to be of high profile in which it appeared that there was a problem of anti-Semitism on college campuses greater than what had appeared, <coughs> what had appeared before. 
2004. 2004, I um, uh, spoke to the staff at Office for Civil Rights, or issued memos uh, to them, and I made it clear that if there were cases involving groups that had either any sort of religious aspect to them, as well as non-religious, I would like to know about any religious claims they made. Because at the time, if you said to an official in the San Francisco or New York office of the Office for Civil Rights, I'm a Jewish student and I've been harassed, the response would be, I'm sorry to hear that, there's nothing we can do. You're Jewish, that's a religion. That's a religion and we have no jurisdiction over religious discrimination. Now, if you had said, I'm an Arab Muslim and I've been harassed, they would say, Pull up a chair, let's talk about that. Islam is a religion, we have no jurisdiction, but Arab is a national origin, and if there's any way that we can find that your discrimination was at least in part on the basis of national origin, then you may have a claim. So I've got a case involving a man who said, my 12-year-old son was beaten up and called Osama because of his Sikh faith was in New Jersey. The New York office dutifully sent it to me. It was a case that would have been dismissed out of hand, uh, but they knew that I was interested. Would have been dismissed after all the father had said it was on the basis of his Sikh faith. My observation in the first place was the legal basis, whether religion, national origin, race, or so on and so forth, is a matter of law for us to decide, and the witness testimony can only tell us about the fact, not the legal characterization. But Sikhism, whether it is purely a religion or whether it has other characteristics which might qualify for protection, is, is actually a subtle question. And I ended up directing an investigation, directing an investigation, and uh, giving, the, uh, giving the guidance that for Sikhs, as for Jews, as for other groups, if there are characteristics, whether of common uh, dress or language or geographical origins, uh, which may be ethnic or ancestral in character, we will assert race or national origin jurisdiction, whether or not that group also has a religious character. The religious character of a particular group will not prevent us from asserting jurisdiction. So that led to a policy that I issued, which uh, was done in the context of the Sikh faith, but which in my mind I knew uh, was probably going to be more applicable in the case of the anti-Semitism that we saw increasingly uh, around the country. Well, no sooner did I issue this new policy, it was an informal policy, saying that, that we would deal with mixed, uh, mixed issues uh, for groups that have both ethnic and uh, religious characteristics, then we got a blunderbuss of a complaint, a massive lengthy complaint of the sort I've seen very few of. NAACP occasionally will come up with uh, complaints of the detail and specificity. It came from an organization that I had not been familiar with as a civil rights organization. It came from the Center for Law and Justice of the Zionist Organization of America. And they detailed a lengthy series of uh, incidents on the campus of the University of California at Irvine. Are some of you familiar with the Irvine matter? Some of you are. Some of you are. Uh, so you may know that by now it has become a uh, rather notorious situation on that campus. ZOA was able, uh, through the work of attorney uh, Susan Tuckman, to document a substantial pattern of anti-Semitic incidents over a period of years and what they alleged to be inadequate response by the administration at Irvine. It ranged from rock throwing and stomping to death threats to destruction of a Holocaust memorial to destruction of personal property, uh, yelling and screaming. It did involve uh, words, but the words were uh, in uh, various sorts of uh, settings, lectures uh, on campus where uh, people would talk about there are good Jews and there are bad Jews. Uh, they, would, uh, they would frequently, uh, in, these, in these talks, castigate Israel and Zionists. In some cases, Zionism was clearly uh, thinly veiled as a religion to Jews. In some cases, they would just talk about, about Jews. Uh, and criticized Jews. So we had a, a fairly lengthy pattern and opened an investigation. Well, long story short, the biggest part of that case was dismissed after my departure by my successor.
successor, who took a narrower view of what it means for the government to prohibit discrimination on the basis of race or national origin. About a year or so ago, in a matter that's still technically on appeal, and which the Obama administration will likely have to address, the Office for Civil Rights said that all of this stuff, some of it's time barred, some of it wasn't sufficiently uh, backed by uh, evidence, uh, but the rest of it simply did not amount to discrimination on the basis of national origin. They looked very carefully to see whether discrimination was specifically alleged by Jewish students who are of Israeli origin. But other than the question of whether Israeli students might have Israeli national origin discrimination, OCR didn't even address the race discrimination issue. Couldn't address it at all. Just ignored it. And ignored it, I think, most likely for the two reasons for which OCR had been rejecting these cases all the way up until 2004 on the issue of the policy. The first was what I mentioned before, which is that Congress had an opportunity to prohibit religious discrimination, and it deliberately took the word religion out from Title VI. And OCR did not want to exceed its jurisdictional boundaries by, by uh, enforcing something which it didn't have the power to enforce. But second, because OCR uh, believed that Jews are not a race, and that it would be inappropriate to characterize Jews as a, as a race. And that is the reason why I think up until 2004, and since 2006, OCR has essentially rejected complaints of anti-Semitic harassment by, by Jewish students. Now, I think they're wrong. I think that's wrong for perhaps as many as, as four reasons. Now, there was one reason, there was one reason that I articulated in 2004 when I was at, at OCR. And a few others which I've taken the opportunity of writing this paper and speaking here to, to flesh out a little bit. The one reason that I used when I was at OCR was historical. It was based on the intent of Congress. And I used that reason because it was a legal structure that had been adopted in analogous situations by the Supreme Court. One years before, the Supreme Court had asked almost the same question. They had asked, are Jews a race? And they asked it in a civil rights context, but it was in the context of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. There was a synagogue called Shari Tefila in Silver Spring. Any familiar? Probably less familiar with the situation. So one, one or two of you are familiar. So you know that about 20 years ago, there was a, a series of acts of vandalism against Shari Tefila synagogue. And, Silver Spring. And the question came up, what do we do about it? The congregation sued the uh, alleged vandals, saying that this was a uh, violation of the Old Civil Rights Act and we should get, we should get uh, damages. It uh, deprived of, uh, us of our use of property based on race. Based on race. Well, that was a controversial situation. Does a synagogue really want to say that we have faced discrimination on the basis of, of race? The district court rejected the argument, saying Jews aren't a race. And the Court of Appeals also rejected the argument, saying Jews are not a race. And because Jews are not a race, they should not be able to avail themselves of the civil rights law. Now, interestingly, at almost the same time, there was a professor who was denied tenure at a university, and he said that it was because he was an Arab. And he sued under the same statute, where national origin and discrimination wasn't good enough. He had to prove that he was discriminated against on the basis of race. And there, the trial court had no problem saying that Arabs were a race. And the Court of Appeals had no problem saying that Arabs were a race. So at the same time, coming up to the Supreme Court were two cases, one saying that Arabs are a race, the other saying that Jews aren't. They had, to address, they had to address that question. The organized Jewish communities, when the congregation first brought its, its case, were slow to uh, champion its cause. But as the case worked its way through the system, at least a, a few of them made the argument that 
and a bigot discriminates against Jews on the basis of race, then that's racism, and it should be enough to constitute discrimination on the basis of race. That had actually convinced one of the judges in the Court of Appeals, but it was a dissenting judge. When it got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, we're going to, refer, we're going to affirm that Arabs are a race, we're going to reverse on the Jewish case. We're going to say Jews are a race. We're not going to adopt the argument made by the congregation and by the Jewish organizations that subjective intent matters, that the question is whether the bigot was uh, acting based on a mistaken, uh, a mistaken uh, prejudice, because we, the Supreme Court, don't believe that that's what was prohibited. What was prohibited is racial discrimination, not mistaken racial discrimination. But the court said Jews are a race. Jews are a race very specifically within the meaning of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Because when you, and these are conservative judges using the theory of original intent, saying that in the theory of original intent, if you ask what did Congress mean in 1866 when it prohibited uh, racial discrimination, uh, Jews were actually mentioned, and so were Arabs and lots of other groups, because the idea of race was so broad in 1866 that it included Jews. So the court said that what we need to do is ask what was meant by Congress in 1866, and how would it be understood by the public in 1866. And based on that, we say that to this day, under that particular statute, Jews are a race. Now, the first thing I wanted to do was to have the legal support behind me of the Supreme Court as a government official, and to say I was simply applying federal law as, as decided by the Supreme Court. Now, for most of the people I talked to, they said, well, no, it goes the other way. Under that precedent, Jews are not a race under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because the logic of that decision is that you need to ask what was the intent of Congress in 1964, and how was the word race understood by the public in 1964. And just as race had a broad meaning in 1866, it had a relatively narrow meaning in 1964. And by 1964, most people didn't think Jews were a race, and most Jews didn't consider themselves to be members of the distinct race. And that's been the case since the Second World War. And that, I think, had been essentially the consensus view of how you interpret the Supreme Court case, Shari Tequila versus Cobb, to the 64 Act. But the point that I made at that time, and my first, my first point about whether uh, anti-Semitism is racism, is that to faithfully apply original intent, you have to ask what did Congress mean in 1964. And what Congress meant in 1964 was not to create a new set of rights dealing with race discrimination, which we have to interpret under 64 uh, racial understandings. What Congress intended in 1964, and this is very clear from the floor debate, and in other contexts it's been recognized by the Supreme Court as well, what, what Congress wanted to do in 1964 was to create an enforcement system that would realize <coughs> the set of rights that were established in the 1860s. In other words, what Congress was saying is that we are not creating or changing any rights or altering any rights. We are just creating a way of enforcing the rights that already exist. So the rights that already existed in 1866 are the rights that are enforced under the 64 Act. And for that reason, and this is the policy that officially is still on the books at OCR, the 1964 Act should be understood to protect those same rights as broadly as they were interpreted by the Supreme Court against race discrimination within the meaning that was first established in the 1860s. Now, I believe that that is um, a solid, uh, is a solid historical legal interpretation of the 64, uh, 64 Congress's intent and the 1866 Congress's. But as I went back to this to try to expand the an analysis, it occurs to me that, that this whole structure, this whole analytical structure is only as good as the current Supreme Court. That when we get new members, say with a new president who may have the opportunity to, the, the whole methodology of originalism is less likely to, to continue in force in the future. And we have to ask, what are the different ways of addressing a question which a different sort of court might ask? If it is not, if it is not bound by uh, 
uh, the originalist theory, which the conservative members of the current court adhere to. After all, the originalist theory had various, various problems, particularly in the context of this situation. I mean, think about it. It's true that this methodology, this way of looking at the issue, has led to protections for Jews in the Shari Tefila case and can lead to protections, I believe, for college students in, the, uh, in an Irvine-type case. On the other hand, there is at best a certain awkwardness to uh, solidifying the uh, 19th century notions of race and basing 21st century uh, jurisprudence uh, on our ideas of what race were in the 1860s, uh, which are rejected by essentially everybody, by the public, by scientists, by, every, by everyone else. There is at least a, a certain peculiarity to allowing that to continue to be the foundation for, uh, for rights against anti-Semitism in educational institutions. So I've looked at it in, in I'd say, three other ways. Since the court <coughs> in Sartafila most conspicuously said, we'll look at the history and congressional intent rather than what modern scientific theory says, it occurs to me that one has to at least be ready to address the question, what does modern scientific theory say about it? And I'm just going to quickly go over, go over this piece. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated one. I think that for many people, the answer is obvious. For many people, the answer is obvious, which is that if you want to look at modern science, Jews are not a race. And there are any number of different statements of this in the, in the literature. Jews are obviously not a race because race is a biological designation, is one classical formulation of this. And I think that that's a, a commonly held popular view for why Jews can't be considered a race. It proves too much, though, of course, because race as a biological designation uh, is, is an essentially discredited notion. Jews are not a race, it seems to me, for largely the same reason that nobody else is either which is to say that the notion of race no longer has any sort of uh, scientific validity uh, within both either the natural or the, or the social sciences. But where does that get you? Does that get you to the point that nobody, nobody should have protection against race discrimination? Well, it may get you to the conclusion that this isn't the right way of looking at it, maybe. Um, I'll just very quickly say, although I discussed it a little bit greater length in the paper, that uh, to accept the notion that race is a social construct is not necessarily to foreclose the question as to whether Jews are a race in the sense of social construction. That is to say, it is at least a coherent question as to whether uh, Jews in general, or Ashkenazic Jews, or light-skinned Ashkenazic Jews, however you want to put the question, there's at least a coherent question as to whether American Jews have been racialized as a distinct uh, population group such that they should have protection under the civil rights laws. And I think that it is a, a subtle and difficult one, which could be argued either way, and we can talk, talk about it a little bit later if you would like to. But what I would say is that the obvious answer is clearly wrong. It is not obvious whether or not one would consider Jews to be a distinct race if one is looking at uh, social construction. Third is to ask about public meaning, general public meaning. Under the notion that, under the notion that, as society evolves, our legal concepts change, and courts should not be stuck in 17th century, uh, sorry, 18th century or 19th century ideas about whether it's race, whether it's due process whether it's about speech, whether it's about press, uh, whether it's about um, uh, uh, punishment or certitude, that we have evolving notions of justice and we should use contemporary uh, concepts to flesh out uh, the terms of the Constitution or, or statutes. So if one were to ask, well, what is the general public meaning? What is our general public understanding? Well, there again, I think that there might be an obvious answer to that, and it might also be wrong, just as there are obvious question, answers to the first two parts, which are also wrong. For the Jewish community, if you ask the question, are Jews a race? Not necessarily anthropologists or
geneticists, the Jewish community are Jews, Jews a race, their religion, both race, religion, so on and so forth. I think you'll get very few people who say a race, virtually none. On the other hand, you will get a very large number of people who do not say Jews are just a religion. Who will say either that Jews are an ethnicity or that Jews are both an ethnicity and a religion, if those are, are the options. And I know there's research that that's, uh, will be coming out shortly, uh, which demonstrates that both for the, for the Jewish community, the non-Jewish community, and also specifically for, for college faculty. Uh, that the greatest single answer is both religion and uh, ethnicity. Well, in this context, one thing that I'm going to say about it is that race has been defined in contemporary jurisprudence as being a shared ethnic or ancestral characteristics. And if the question is, uh, do, uh, do members of the public generally or the Jewish community believe that the Jewish people have shared ethnic or ancestral characteristics, I think that there is at least a, a basis for the answer that yes. Those are, I would say, three, three ways of asking the question, are Jews a race? In order to answer the question, should anti-Semitism be considered to be a form of racism? The best way of answering the question, though, I think, is not to ask, are Jews a race? But rather, is anti-Semitism a form of racism? Which is, like the dissent in the Shari Tefila case, a way of saying that we should look at subjective intent. Asking not so much, or at least not exclusively, what is the character of the victim who, who claims protection, but asking what is the nature of the bigotry faced by, uh, by the Jewish people. Now, that too opens up a series of, of questions, but I think that is the best ground on which the question should be addressed. Now, at this point, I think we could go in a lot of different directions, but I, I'd certainly love to hear comments or questions. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, we can open it up. We have about a half an hour. So. I think that, especially since the Nazi era, yes. I started before the Nazis came to power, uh, the whole notion of uh, anti-Semitism as a religious uh, uh, notion, uh, the, uh, it, it became passive. Uh, and but we call, refer today to as the uh, new racism is essentially based on notions that the, na the Nazis had uh, propagated. Uh, you, uh, you examine the kind of uh, cartoons. None of them deals with, with religious issues. All of them were with ethnic, which you can refer to as racial whether the children of, ma of uh, uh, monkeys or, or, or any other uh, description that is included in those uh, cartoons. So it, as you refer to the, the end, it's more important how the anti-Semite practice the anti-Semitism, not what we consider ourselves to be. We might consider ourselves to be part of uh, a group of people, some may which is uh, to be just part of a uh, religion, but that is immaterial. It, what's more important is that how the anti-Semite <coughs> perceive, perceive us. And they perceive us today, the anti-Semitism is uh, ethical, not religious. Thank you. <laughs> I think that fleshed out what I was saying at the end. Cool. Well, here we go to uh, biology. And, and race. Uh, I think you must have read the recent report from Spain uh, about the testing of DNA of some sample, I think it was a thousand uh, Spaniards. And uh, the report stated that uh, checking the DNA that, that, uh, that the 20% of that sample were uh, Jews, Sephardic Jews. Uh, so, unless this is fiction, 
there certainly are some scientists who are making the DNA connection uh, with jewelry. What do you what do you have to say about that? Yeah. Um, there's actually a section in my paper that I didn't have time to cover here where I addressed that as part of the, um, the second of the four arguments. The first is historical and the second is scientific. Yeah. And going over scientific, I think that if one is looking at contemporary science, one has to look mostly at uh, contemporary race theory and the sort of construction of race. But uh, for purposes of conclusion, I think one has to recognize that there is at least a growing minority, particularly among geneticists, uh, to a lesser extent among social scientists, uh, who accept that there may be um, that there may be um, certain um, genetic commonalities among large number large numbers of, of Jews, and uh, one sees it in different sorts of uh, uh, studies uh, about um, uh, both looking at Ashkenazi and, and, and Sephardic, looking at um, uh, commonalities to find that there are. Some genetic qualities that are very disproportionately held by Jews, unless it was non Jews, uh, except in the Middle East, where one sees a, a, a greater in, intermixture. Um, I, I do think that's a useful part of the picture. And what I take from that is that even if one were to look at contemporary population genetics rather than anthropology as a source for identifying what does modern science say about the situation. There, too, the argument that Jews are a race is probably as strong as the argument that anybody else is a race. So, if I can make some comments, um, sort of following up what you said. So, I, I agree. So, if race is a social construction, I actually did my research on social construction of identity and race. And as a footnote, I, I didn't grow up in the United States. So, coming to the United States, I always find it kind of humorous in a way that many Jewish people here consider themselves to be white given that I would say that whiteness is more of sort of a historical category, which Jews were certainly not considered a part of, and that's okay that came on this price for nothing. Yeah, yeah. So growing up in Canada, and I think European Jews, we would consider us, ourselves to be Jewish. Uh, and I, I don't think necessarily as a race, but being Jewish. I think mean, white people in Canada were people from England, and perhaps those were the white people, and the rest of us were others. Um, so, so it is a social construction, and given Jewish history, when Jews were considered to be Semitic, they paid the price, and now in the United States, they are considered by many Jews and others to be white. And it's interesting, I think, how the notion of whiteness expands in the United States, historically. So even I think Italians and Spanish people, except at some point in time, were not considered white either. But whiteness is expanding for all sorts of reasons, and maybe perhaps we can migration from South America and all sorts of reasons that the notion of whiteness expands. But my question in terms of anti-Semitism, as anti-Semitism becomes more and more linked to Zionism and the state of Israel, is there a room in the American legal system, because the kids at Columbia University or at Irvine or San Francisco State University were attacked in part because they were aligned with Israel, or being perceived as supporters of Israel. So even though they're American citizens and their origin is not Israeli, they're being labeled as supporters of a national origin, or part of a national origin. Is there room in the legal system to sort of call this a form of discrimination? Yes, and let me hit that first, and I want to swing back to the other. Um, yes. Now, for those of us who think that the primary way of addressing the question is subjective intent, asking, is the anti-Semitic person driven by racial misunderstandings, rather than asking our Jewish race. For those of us who say we want to go the way of subjective intent, here's the rub. Here's the rub. If you look what's actually happening on college campuses and ask, uh, what are the alleged discriminators saying and doing, they will very seldom use explicit statements that connect them up with any sort of racism, explicit, explicit racism. They will sometimes. In the Shara Tefila case, you had uh, you had people with uh, Ku Klux Klanish uh, comments and, and symbols and statements that they were making. It was easier to see that these were old-fashioned uh, bigots who had a who clearly had a racial misunderstanding of, of Jews. But 
if you're on the campus of San Francisco State or Irvine or Wayne State or Columbia or somewhere else, you are less likely to hear anything that sounds explicitly, explicitly racist. You will hear a lot about Israel. You will hear a lot about Zionism. And so the surrounding evidence, the surrounding circumstances say political. They don't say religious, but they may not say racial as much as they say political. So the question is, does it have to be racial intent? Well, oftentimes it's going to be hard to find racial intent. Now, we know that this is not limited to anti-Semitism because we know that this is a characteristic generally true of the new racism, which is to say that if one wants to, uh, to find uh, whether there's racism in the denial of employment to an African-American or different sorts of harassment or discrimination against Hispanics, uh, racial intent is almost always hidden. It's almost always hidden because of the stigma associated hidden whether one is talking about uh, African Americans or, or Jews. So it's going to be often a very difficult case, case to make. There is sometimes, however, surrounding evidence that you can look to. The cartoons, for instance, will have clearly uh, racial or biological characteristics. So if an incident takes place within an environment where there's enough surrounding circumstances, you will often find statements made, pictures, things that, that link it. I believe that generally speaking, the phenomenon is not exclusively or even largely political. It's a phenomenon that, that carries with it much of the old racial baggage, and it even carries within it many of the stereotypes and defamations from long before the, 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 Nazi, the Nazi era. So the trick, though, is, in, is, to, is to find that. But um, in in environments, in hostile environments where you have a lot of anti-Jewish stuff going on, you will very frequently find people make comments about Jews that clearly are at least partly racial in, in, in character. The harder thing is when you just have one person beats up another. How do you know? How do you know what the intent is? Um, OCR clearly was not up to the the task in the Irvine case. In the Irvine case, the fascinating investigation took place after, largely after, after my departure. One thing that was interesting about the case is that the investigators actually went on campus at Irvine to hear what was going on themselves. And this was unique in, 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 my, in, in my recollection, is that in many cases, the investigators were not merely reporting what they were told by others. In many cases, the investigators would actually be at Irvine, and they would hear with their own ears the most horrible anti-Semitic rants um, being, being made on, on that campus. And the OCR closure letter rejected the case, which is now on appeal, admitted that much of this was offensive to, to Jewish students at, at Irvine. But OCR concludes that it was on the basis of a political conviction rather than on the basis of national origin. Now, I've explained why I think it's a mistake just to ask the national origin. You also have to ask the, the race and national origin. But that still doesn't answer this question from, from Charles, which is, um, is it really on the basis of race, national origin, or religion broadly construed when it looks like it's just about religion? Now, that's another paper uh, on, unto itself, um, but in a, in, a, in a word, my view is that racial anti-Semitism didn't come out of nowhere, and Bill Maher didn't all of a sudden cut out everything that came before, that, that, this, that the stereotypes and defamations of uh, religious were then integrated with it. And in the same way, uh, the political includes the other, to the extent that, to the extent that uh, all of these, or many of these anti-Semitic statements that were heard by the investigators, while made in a political context, had clearly racial, racial and ethnic themes to them. And to the extent that there are racial and ethnic themes bound up with political or religious or anything else, it seems to me that 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 is at least in part within the rubric of ethnic or ancestral discrimination. Oh, oh, and, um, one, one last thing on your first point. Um, uh, 
I do think that the question of whiteness is really a fascinating, a fascinating issue. I agree with you that it is much more complicated than uh, than I think the sort of the uh, stereotypical issue is, and that the uh, the resolution of that question is certainly closely related to the question of what is anti-Semitism. The uh, hate crimes law in this country takes into consideration subjective intent. Now, I worked for the Anti-Defamation League. I was involved um, with this issue in developing and giving out hate crimes cards to all the police in Connecticut. And it specifies that if someone is to be arrested for a hate crime, if someone assaults you because he thinks you are um, Jewish, or he thinks you are black, or he thinks you are gay, and you're not, it doesn't matter, because it was the intent of the person who assaulted you <coughs> that would get him arrested and could get him charged with a hate crime, which has um, extra punitive measures attached to it. So it, it doesn't matter. I mean, if somebody who was not Jewish dressed up in a Hasidic costume and walked on the streets and had eggs thrown at him, that's a hate crime, even if the person isn't Jewish because the intent was to harm somebody because he was perceived to be Jewish. Yes and no. Yes and no. That's definitely the case with the hate crime statute here in this country. What you say is true, but it's a little more subtle. It's a little more subtle than, it's a little more subtle than that. The question came up in the uh, Crown Heights case. Uh, uh, the Crown Heights case where um, uh, the, uh, the victim uh, that or his family said uh, it was because uh, I, I, you know, he was he was beaten because this uh, during the riot uh, I was it was hate on the basis of race. It, the whole law that was being used as a as a basis for the lawsuit was a subjective intent subjective intent statute, but the question was subjective intent to to harass this person on the basis of what? On the basis of race. Well, what is race? And the, the statute asks about the subjective intent of, uh, what was his name, Lemerick? 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 Okay. It asked about this, it was all about the subjective intent, but it was still, it was still a question for the court as to what subjective intent mattered. Um, and if you could, you, had, you certainly had to prove that there was an, a subjective intent to harm the victim on the basis of race. Yes, you had to prove that there was an objective intent to harm the person on the basis of race. But the question still remained, if there was a subjective intent to harm the person on the grounds that he was Jewish, was that a subjective intent to harm the person on the basis of race or not? Religion is protected in terms of the hate crime was, unlike what you're describing on college campuses, Another thing, the issue on college campuses, and we face this at the Anti-Defamation League, is the right of free speech. And so somebody could be arrested under the hate crimes laws if he uh, assaulted you because he thought you were gay. But if he calls you uh, a nasty epithet because he thinks that, he can't be arrested because it's not a crime that's committed, because it's free speech. And a lot of what goes on, and is so anti-Semitic on the college campuses happens in the classroom or happens for in extracurricular activities where the arguments on the part of the authorities on the campuses are that this is a matter of free speech and we don't squelch any kind of conversation on a college campus. Yeah. Um, well, that issue comes up all the time when one talks about anti-Semitism. Occasionally when one talks about race, and never, or almost never, one talks about other things, like gender. The selective use of the free speech argument on college campuses, I think, is one of the most salient a aspects of the, the free speech issue. I totally agree with that. At the in the Irvine case, the administrators became, I would say, free speech absolutists in saying there's absolutely nothing that we can do when things are said and done on, on campus. They have an absolute right of, of free speech. Well, just a few 
months before that, there had been an affirmative action bake sale on that same campus. You know what I mean? Yeah. Evident affirmative action bake. That's where uh, that's a sort of uh, that's a protest by conservative groups where they sell cookies or brownies and they say it's five dollars or it's a dollar. It's, it's a dollar if you're white. It's fifty cents if you're black. <laughs> as a way of illustrating the perceived unfairness of racial preferences. Well, Irvine very quickly stamped that out. Very quickly said, this protest has no place on campus. We will not let you do this. And almost immediately after, and without any sense of irony or inconsistency, said that uh, you can uh, write whatever you want on the, on the Jewish posters and say whatever you want about Jews, and that's absolute free speech. I don't, I don't mean to belittle the importance of free speech protection. But I do think that the selective use with which they're applied is, is uh, conspicuous. And I would say that the law on this is, is largely unsettled. It's largely unsettled. Um, if the first case to go to the Supreme Court dealing with this issue involves anti-Semitism, I would say the court will have a very strong First Amendment uh, opinion. Uh, if it deals with, with race, it's 50-50. And if it's uh, sexual harassment, uh, Free speech protection, I think, at least based on what the lower courts have done, is less likely to be uh, to be emphasized. Although, whichever way the court goes, will then be harmonized as among all of them, likely. In other words, there's no principled way of distinguishing free speech to harass women versus Hispanics versus blacks versus Jews. It has to be the same law. Uh, and yet, the way that they're dealt with, in fact, has Um, I'm curious how representative of how much issue there is in anti-Semitism on campus. You've given us several high-profile cases, and I'm, I'm wondering how, how pervasive is this, or is it isolated in a few places? Well, that's an excellent question, and nobody has an answer. Uh, there are some who will say there are a few isolated high-profile incidents, but that doesn't make a pattern, and that in general, there's no big there's no big problem. Just a few things going on, and others who will argue that anti-Semitism has become systemic in higher education and it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. We don't know how much how much there is. There's no real uh, reliable federal record keeping. There was in the last Congress bill introduced that would marginally improve federal hate crimes record. Record keeping, but not to the point where the government will be able to answer this question. Anti Defamation League comes out with a number every year, which might be 80, which might be 90, which might be 100 or 105 incidents. And on the one hand, that may, in some respects, overcount because there might be very minor incidents that are included. It's only the ones that are recorded for the Anti Defamation League. Uh, okay, let me yeah. finish the sentence right now. Um, it may include minor incidents, and they might not be checked in the same way that the federal government might check them. On the other hand, as 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 uh, Marcia Stein, as Marcia Stein said, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's only what's what's recorded, and I believe that what's recorded is a very tiny fraction of the of the total number. What's reported to the ADL doesn't include everything that's reported to every campus, and what's reported to every campus, I think, is a I go on, on college campuses and, and ask students, um, have you seen or heard any incident that's anti-Semitic? I will invariably get a few hands that go up. Then when I press and give examples, I'll get some more hands that go up. Then when I say, keep your hands up if you reported it to the ADL, or, no, the hands start coming, or they haven't reported to anybody. So I would say that it's got to be a multiple of the number 100 but it's hard to say what it is. Now, what you make of this, suppose the number is 400 or 600. I, I still believe that it is a small, it is a tiny fraction of the interaction that Jewish students have on campus. And I would, character, I would characterize this as, as, a, as an excellent time to be Jewish on American college campuses where there are far more incidents of philo-Semitism than anti-Semitism where the uh, great uh, majority of college faculty and, and students uh, do not harbor uh, strong anti-Semitic feelings. So 
So it's um, it's not the it's, it's not the most pervasive aspect of, of public life. On the other hand, I would also say that there are a large enough number of incidents, including at least a handful of significant patterns, that it's a that it's a real problem that needs to be addressed. And moreover, I think that the situation on American college campuses really needs to be understood in the context of what's going on around the world mm -hmm. and in history to see that what one sees in a place like Irvine or San Francisco or Columbia is particularly disturbing when one sees the connections to what's happening in Europe, the Middle East, and, and elsewhere, because that's what makes us worry about will it decrease in number, will it go beyond the college campus. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, uh, it's very interesting. Um, and I, can, I think I can understand your perspective as a social psychologist because I can really relate with in-group, out-group, and, out and also the educational meaning of uh, convicting someone with anti-Semitism. However, um, my Victor is a clinician in Israel, so we used to give evaluation uh, for um, patients sometimes which didn't really match. We only wanted them to get the treatment or to not get the, you know, the diagnosis of schizophrenia, for example, because yeah, you take a person and or on, on the other hand, you give them the evalu another evaluation for, for them to get the, the right treatment that they have. Uh, so, so my approach is like more pragmatic. Uh, what? Uh, so, if you want to, you know, to reduce uh, or to uh, avoid uh, students to be harassed in college, what other options you have? If like you have this problem with uh, racism, if, if it's a problem in, with the law, so what other options you have? Like verbal violence, for example, or just harassment or violence in general. I mean, what ways used to resolve these problems given the problems in the law now? I mean, so you just, you know, just because of this problem in the law, I, mean, I understand that <coughs> there's no solution and then students just uh, get out without punishment. So if I understand correctly, or you don't know. Ultimately, I don't think the law is enough, although I do think the law can do a lot more than perhaps I, I expressed, because I, I, I do believe that, um, I do believe that Title VI prohibits virtually all anti-Semitic discrimination and harassment in college campuses, and it's my hope that uh, the Obama administration recognizes this and follows the policy that is in fact on the books. Uh, and if it does so, it, it has tools in place to ensure that college campuses are appropriately addressing anti-Semitism when it occurs. Now that's just one step. The federal government can do very little. The federal government will have it most of the cases. It will deal with it after the fact and when there's already a huge problem. But when the federal government is there in the background as a motivation, we will find that college administrators will start taking various actions to reduce the likelihood of these things happening. Okay. Okay. Pardon? Grants. They can do that, and they can um, whether it's uh, whether it's with orientation, whether it's with training, whether it's appropriate supervision, so on and so forth. There are things that the, that the university that the university can do. Ultimately, ultimately, that's only going to be <coughs> I mean, the law. The law can be a motivator to creating all sorts of systems on a campus, uh, whether it's in terms of the supervision, whether it's in terms of the way manuals are written, whether it's in terms of orientation and training and so on and so forth, um, that is important. But ultimately, if you have people who are on campus who want to say this sort of thing, the ultimate solution to it isn't just training administrators to deal with these things when people want to say them or do them. It has to go beyond that. So ultimately, I think that you as a psychologist um, or people from other sorts of disciplinary backgrounds might have more to say with how you get to the problem because for the problem to be solved, it has to be before it gets to the campus. But I, So I, I think that using the law and using higher education administration is a way of dealing with a problem that already exists, although ultimately the goal is to prevent the problem before it gets there. But that part of it is Online. But in the law, don't you have other options except for racism, for example, violence or harassment or other options to define the problem but in a different way so the person who is guilty gets his punishment 
given the problem of the law. Yeah, but they, they're all but they're, they don't necessarily uh, they don't necessarily work. I mean, there if you look at all of the campuses where there've been incidents, uh, and you ask the question, how many of these incidents, if true, are a violation of uh, state and local criminal law? You'll find well, lots of them, lots of them are. But then if you ask how many times has there been a prosecution, you'll find almost never. Um, so there, there are lots of tools, but they're not usually, they're not usually used. And so the point of the civil rights law is, is to provide a way of dealing with social problems that may be outlawed and may even be criminalized, but that for various reasons are not, are not being addressed properly. So we have three minutes, so what I would like to do is uh, literally very quick question and quick response. I know. Josh, no, 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 no. Josh, and then the person that was beside you, and then Sharon. So very quickly, please. Sure. It's, it's not the, a question. Well, maybe we would quickly address it, but um, if not, we can continue. It's along the lines of you say law is something that can deal with a problem that already exists, but law also creates effects in the world, obviously. Um, one, and one criticism that I know just in a moment I want to take that in two parts. One, there's a question, is there problems with the effects of defining Jews as a race for this purpose? And I would say yes, and that's why I think the subjective intent is better than the historical approach because of the ultimate effects that are created when we uh, institutionalize the notion of Jews as a race or Jews as a national origin. But as to the broader question of the potential adverse effects of extending civil rights protection to <coughs> Jews, I would say that I am I am not as concerned about that. Looking at I mean, because Jews have had civil rights protections under Title VII in employment, and I don't see a massive backlash as a result of that, nor a massive backlash against blacks because of the protections under the host system. So I don't I don't think it's a problem in general for extending the civil rights protections, but it's a reason to be careful about the um, the uh, foundation of the protection. Okay. Uh, very briefly, uh, was any definitions of race in Title VII in the employment situation helpful for you? And also, did the Supremes at all comment on ethn uh, ethnicity in either the Sherry field or the Arab case? Well, in the um, in the uh, Arab case, uh, St. Francis College, uh, race was defined characteristics. So essentially the court um, knocked down the, the division between race and national origin, at least implicitly, which I think is correct. Yeah. I'm sorry, the other part of the question yeah, was, was whether, whether the, oh. the, the, in the definition of race would the employment situation in Title VII be helpful? Um, I, in terms of legislative history and of the use of the term race in Title VII, I can't think of anything that's been helpful. I don't know if there's anything you haven't had in mind. I've, I've never done it in Title VI. I've done stuff in Title VII, and it gets heavily into race. It has a it has definition of whether someone qualifies for protection under that. So I was wondering if, if that would have been useful. I mean, in, in general, because there's so much Title VII law and so little Title VI law, well, that's why I've asked. Invariably, when you don't have an answer to Title VI, you go to Title VII. But the thing about Title VII is that religious discrimination is prohibited. So they, there isn't a need to uh, ask the, um, the finely grained questions about, uh, about race of that sort. Thank you. The last question. In light of, of, of what was asked before, there was already a United Nations resolution that described Zionism as racism. And in light of what was uh, asked before, I'm afraid of the repercussions of, um, and again, that, that uh, resolution of the United Nations was um, after a while. 
in the mm-hmm. would change, yeah. But I'm afraid that the discussion uh, would yield uh, outcomes that we, we, we do not uh, we do not want and we do not uh, seek. This is one thing I wanted to ask you: if there is any chance of amending Title VI and uh, uh, adding religion as one of the uh, on, on your first point, I would say that um, despite the potential of a backlash, there has been enormous value served, for instance, by those who lobby the uh, European, European Union Monitoring Committee to develop the working definition of anti-Semitism. And I think that that, that, that international effort to focus on this aspect of uh, the new anti-Semitism had far more in a way positive effects than negative effects. As to your second question, um, I, I think that title that either Title VI should be amended to include religion, or that there should be a new a new uh, bill to prohibit religious discrimination in, in education. And I've I've spoken with different congressional staff. Some have seemed interested, but it hasn't really gotten to the point of. Uh, Just uh, before I thank you, um, I just want to make one quick announcement. Next Tuesday, we're having a special lecture. It's the William Prusoff uh, Honorary Lecture. Professor Prusoff, is, you know, I'm sure many of you know, he's a professor of pharmacology here, and he was one of the first supporters of the idea of DISA. We're having the second annual William Prusoff Lecture, and our special guest will be Benny Morris. And it's going to be next uh, Tuesday, the 3rd of February. So it'll be a special event. I hope you can come and tell people about it. Um, and Ken, thank you very much for coming. I'm sorry.